be better off with them, yeah. or what, what does that look like? Okay, I, mean, I didn't do any. Uh, I didn't do any specific, but if you do look at the gangs and you know their who all, a lot of times it is by race. Like there's a lot of gangs that are racially uh, divided. Again, with the Aryan Brotherhood and MS13. Is that the one you yes, mentioned? Yes, yeah. Uh, a lot of times that's how it is. That's true. They tend to pair off on race. Okay, so. Uh, gang, gang is obviously gang activity is obviously an issue in prison. Talking about prison reform, how do we fix that pairing off based on race? How do we fix this gang issue? Well, I know when we're reforming. Right now, a lot of times, if there are rival gang members in the same like, cell block, they'll put them in ad seg or ad, um, administrative segregation, solitary confinement. So there, a lot of these people will either, and I know Aaron did a lot of research on solitary confinement. They'll put them in there, or they'll put them with either someone who's in the same gang as them and the same cell, or someone who doesn't have a gang affiliation to hopefully like ease the tension there, but that's not always, obviously, 100%. Aaron, tell me about that solitary. So it involves putting prisoners in small, confined spaces for months or even, there's many people that have been there for many years, and there's about 217,000 prisoners in solitary confinement, and about 7% of that number are in those spaces for 23 hours a day. And there's, it's a pretty controversial topic right now. A lot of people believe that it's not right if those prisoners are human rights. And I do think that that is a very high of a number, but there are uh, especially big mental strengths on these prisoners. And about six, there are 6.9 times more likely to commit some harm acts in there. There's a whole lot of research on the damage that it does to the mentally. But, goes to say a lot of those people could not have already had mental issues to end up in solitary confinement. But I think there's a purpose for it, but maybe not. It should be reserved for more of the higher level of uh, prisoners, those that can't get along with other people. But a lot of people that were seen in solitary confinement are often lower level prisoners involved in like trouble. Do you have any specific case studies? Prisoners that you read about that were sent to solitary confinement, as far as first hand accounts of the race that are So, we actually watched a documentary in Ms. Keck's class um, in AP Lit, and these people, uh, there was one in particular who I believe it was, it was a drug related, I don't think violence was involved, but it was a drug related crime, and he, he, it was almost like he was pleading for help. Like, the documentary was his chance to say that this isn't right. And they seemed very um, hurt and loss of hope. There was just, I couldn't see a whole lot of mental strain. They just seemed really sad, beat down. It, it was sad to watch and it was hard. It left me thinking afterwards on where I landed because I thought, oh, it's, it, there, there's a reason they're in there, I'm sure. But it seems in many cases almost too harsh, um, at least in what we saw. So um, you mentioned that overcrowding has a lot of a lot of these problems. So just the too many people close together in the prisons um, are housing more than they should. Do you have any suggestions or any um, examples of reform that could alleviate some of the overcrowding that we have in prison? So I think what, at least as far as Trump's plan, uh, the ultimate goal is for in the next 10 years to have a large number of these low-level prisoners released back into society, but they would first, they wouldn't be released like tomorrow. They first would go through, I believe it's called community confinement, and where they would, Gracie did a lot more research on this, but they would receive education or religious courses where they would take that eventually, in about 10 years, that number would be back into their communities. And so the answer is not to build more prisoners, but right. the goal is for them. Well, this is just a statistic. So, the U.S. is ranked, at, it sounds a lot less important when you know the number. They're ranked 113th country for overcrowding, but the percentage is by 103.9%. And that just kind of shocked me because I didn't realize, uh, like, how big of an issue this was. Oh, uh, you know, I've heard about off I was like, it might just be in a few prisons in a few states, but it's, I would say it's a national issue, like, 100%, no doubt. Uh, so there, and there's 481 people incarcerated for, per 100,000 of the population, which was also a very alarming statistic that I thought my research. So should we 
killed more persons yesterday. That doesn't address the issue. So we have we have one or two things we have to do. Then. We either have to send less people to prison, or we have to let more people out of prison, right? Yeah. It's the whole bucket of water thing. Either take water out or you know, don't put as much in. So what's, what's our solution? Is it one of those two things? Do we just put less people in prison, or do we let more people out of prison? I think it would, like, you don't want to, obviously, if someone, like, commits a crime against the law, you don't want to just say, well. Well, that's how they get to prison, right? <laughs> yeah, you don't just want to so, say, yeah. like, we're going to release these because it's overcrowded too much. But I think that's why, like, Rehabilitation is important, and I didn't say this like as thoroughly as I should. But Miss Eiler said like we have job programs here um, in other more European countries. It's mandatory. There's educational and job programs that are not optional like here, but required as a part of that prison. And there is one specific prison in Norway as well, and its like main purpose is to be the most humane prison. So. It's kind of in like a woodsy area, and it's meant to be more therapeutic for like healthy depression because that's something that like solitary confinement happens a lot, and so they try to never use solitary confinement unless absolutely necessary and it's for high-level criminals. So within that, they are, I think, helping those prisoners be able to, I guess, regain part of their humanity still, so that they can maybe get out faster, so we can have those more rooms in prison. I'd love to see what the crime rates are in that area. If I'm going to commit a pretty egregious crime, yeah. I'm now going to do it in Norway, wherever that prison is. Yeah. Because if I get caught, I want to go to the place with the lovely view and uh, whatever else it is you just described. I don't have any. Okay. I'm not planning to commit your crimes. We as a society have decided that as a punishment for crime, we're going to separate people society. Does, do those people still have rights? I think they do to an extent. They definitely should not receive all the same things that we do. So how, do how, do you, how do you decide what rights they get right. and what rights they don't have? I think it determines on the level of crime that they've committed um, and how they behave in the prison, whether or not they get along with each other. Okay, so for example, let's say that I am a third time petty theft offender, mm -hmm. so I'm sent away not necessarily because I stole something expensive, but because I'm a repeat offender and it's like three strikes, whatever, I'm going to go away for a long time for stealing a pizza. So since that does, I mean, I get to keep my freedom of religion, but Joe Axe Murder doesn't get freedom of religion because he has a greater crime, is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. Yes and no. I think when it comes to at least freedom of religion, I don't think that that should be taken away from Okay, well, so I was just talking about just in general right. different rights. Uh, I guess it just would depend. If yours is obviously a much lower level, and even though you are repeated, you don't seem to be causing issues amongst other prisoners. Um, most, I guess, you would receive more. And to go up, Aaron, I know, as probably some of you guys have seen in the news, Bernie Sanders is calling to let inmates vote from prison, even non American citizens. Um, I and like I'm trying to form my opinion on that. Obviously, I don't think that you know the Boston bomber, whoever he said, should be able to vote for prison. But my thing is, like those kind of rights are the ones that should be. I don't know the right word I'm saying. Like how you guys are talking about freedom of religion, that's not something that the government should be able to regulate. Um, I don't really know where I was going with that. But those are the kind of rights about like. Being able to vote because I do not think. Yeah. Can, can I ask you a question? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I'm going to ask you what you hear about that. Oh, okay. So, Bernie Sanders wants inmates to be able to vote in prison. Yes. Sir. All right. That's that's what I'm hearing. Okay. Why does Bernie Sanders want inmates to be able to vote from prison? Is it because he went to prison no. or saw a documentary and somebody seemed very heartfelt and it's, they were crying because they couldn't vote and they just longed to vote again? Is that, I mean, he wants their vote. tear it his heartstrings? He wants their vote, right. He believes that. His, really? What he believes is going to receive more support. So he feels like he can maybe tie up a voting demographic there? <laughs> if he allows them to vote, they'll give him their vote in return? Yes, sir. That seems like a really yeah. gregarious thing. Uh, not the question I was going to ask. Please. Oh, <laughs> I thought I had it. I really I did. Had it. Yeah. Um, so my, I guess my, you go back to the, to the rights <laughs> issue. <clears throat> Gracie, what you're trying to express is that there are some rights that are given to us by the government, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And then there are some rights that are just 
human mm -hmm. rights that are God-given rights. Exactly. So can you talk to me? Can, can you talk to us, I guess, about where that line should be drawn in your opinion mm -hmm. for individuals who go to prison? What rights should be stripped from them and what rights may be in a prison not stripped or should a prison not stripped from them? Well, I obviously do not agree with Senator Sanders on his new proposal, and for obvious reasons as well. But there are certain, uh, like I said, I was saying, inalienable rights that I think that we should, you know, not try to restrict or anything like uh, freedom of religion and access to, again, like we were talking about earlier, basic healthcare. I would say just the necessary. And in some of my research as well, and some documentaries I've watched, um, there are cases where women aren't provided with free hygiene products, and that's something that's actually in Donald Trump's new act, is to make that like free, like that they do not have to pay for sanitary products. So certain things like that, I would say, you know, do not restrict them from the prisoner box, and no means am I saying that we should let our prisoners go. I would say like, the government should draw the line at things that affect them. So voting. And well, let me ask you this, because sometimes your exercise of your freedom of religion is going to run afoul of rules and regulations that the warden has put in place to keep order in the prison. Um, things like regulations on dress code or um, meals or um, facial hair or, or you know even when you work, what days and providing time for prayer and things like that. What rights do I have as a prisoner if the warden in his overriding interest in keeping order and safety in the prison has said I have to do these things but it runs afoul of, of, of my religious rights. What should a prisoner do, or is that something that the government should even care about? I was, personally, I feel like, um, I feel like prisoners should have all the rights we get but to, until it causes issues within the prison. So like with religion, if their religious practices starts causing chaos or whatever, then they get that stripped. And then with, um, I disagree with the voting, I feel like they should vote because of the fact that prisoners take up a large population of the nation. I don't know that that's a number, but I remember reading about it and um, it just takes a large chunk out of the population and it takes away from argue that in that case like the prison would be a microcosm of society because it's already understood that if my religious beliefs are going to let's say endanger the life of someone else like there's a form of I can't think of the word right now we talked about it in our Bible class uh, when we were speaking about multiculturalism uh, I think I'm supposed to say I can't think for the life of me what the word is uh, assimilation that's the word I'm thinking of so I, there's some sense of having to assimilate in, in that area, but the, again, that's prevalent in our society anyway. I wouldn't say that that's much different. Obviously, the circumstances and the environment would be different, but that already, whether we looked at it or not, goes on in our day-to-day -day life. Uh, can I ask a follow-up question? So, so far you've been, I guess, focused on uh, domestic prisoners, things like that. What about international prisoners, like terrorists, mm -hmm. for example? Um, should, what should we do in those situations? Well, since this international prisoner, this terrorist, I'm assuming is not a citizen of the United States. Could be. Well, if they're not a citizen Physical. of the United States, they wouldn't be guaranteed the rights that American citizens are having because they're not American citizens. The Constitution doesn't apply to them. And for if like a terrorist is an American citizen, as it's difficult because morally I want to be like you know they've obviously done something horrendous like they I'm assuming that they did something against other American people or uh, whatever but they still as a prisoner it's not like they those inalienable inalienable rights are still God given rights that apply to every. Like the freedom of religion, I'm not going to tell someone that they can't believe. Where, where do those prisoners of war go right now? Do they end up in our federal prisons? Uh, 
I, we didn't do research, but I don't believe so. Do they? Military prison. Okay. Usually booked one time in most place like that. Uh, but there is a push to bring them, a lot of them in certain circumstances, into the federal prison system. What, what would be an issue, and this probably isn't in your notes, but go with me. What would be an issue of introducing those prisoners of war into our national prison system? I think it's unsafe. Okay. I feel like we would. Because um, <laughs> prison, prisoners are usually safe, <laughs> all right? Well, just like, I don't know. I feel like it, can, like it can be really unsafe for them. Because, I feel like they would be attacked mm -hmm. very harshly. At the same time, it's like, morally, you don't want that to happen, but when you do see someone who's you know, really committed those really harsh crimes, it's hard to just say you can go, like, they need the punishment. Yes. Any yeah, other problems with bringing international terrorists or prisoners of war into our federal prison system? Um, actually, like, the federal prisoners, uh, I don't know if they get those kind of news, but uh, They might try to harm the uh, tariffs in order to, yeah, get back at and like get back at them and. Uh, it's it's kind of cruel and usually punish kind of the terrorists. Our prisoners sound like a bunch of patriots. I know. They <laughs> want to fight and they want to kill the terrorists. It's going to cause a lot of disorders. A lot of these terrorists have pledged allegiance to other nations and other things. I think by being in America, it's a much greater threat. They could possibly plan other things while they're there, not just within the prisons, but in America. I don't know. And to bounce off that, too, I don't necessarily uh, believe it would just be patriotism that we're talking about. If you look at, for example, um, sexual offenders, especially when children are involved, they're often targeted by the kind of crime that they commit. So if this person, this terrorist, committed a heinous crime among a, a, like a multi multitude of people, despite if they were American or not, that's still going to cause some sort of uproar because of just the specific type of crime. Um, Aaron, maybe I'll you since you did research on that. Uh, would you say that that's an appropriate time to place that individual in the center? I think so. If they're that those programs then help, I think you may have spoken this, that those programs tend to help those, uh, those prisoners either lessen the recidivism rate or have a positive impact on their fellow inmates? I, yes, I didn't find specific evidence, but this particular person who graduated with a whole other class of group of prisoners that had committed similar offenses. So if those programs have a positive impact on prisoners, we could struggle with your company, right? Why shouldn't we mandate those programs for all prisoners? For all prisoners. All prisoners, all prisoners. I think that if it helps at least one person, that they can have a positive impact on So we're talking about religious, uh, some sort of religious treatment program or other religious-based prison activity. If it's helping the population of prisoners, why shouldn't we just mandate that for all prisoners? Because it will help them all. Freedom of 